Hello and welcome to another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 3, Lesson 6 on Linear Regression. Another title to this could have been Lines of Best Fit. Now a little bit of what we do in this particular lesson is going to require the use of a calculator that will allow you to put in lists of data and then run a linear regression or a line of best fit analysis on it. So make sure that you have some kind of calculator that will allow you to do that and let's jump right into it. Alright, lines of best fit. Often, often in science, a mathematical relationship between two variables is desired for predictive purposes. In the real world, the relationship between two variables is not always a perfect one. Thus, we often look for a best function that can fit the data. Today, we will review how to do this with a linear function. As an aside, as we go through this course, we will also see how to fit data with a quadratic function and with what's known as an exponential function. All right, And we'll get to all of those in time. Lines of best fit you should have done back in Algebra 1. So let's take a look at exercise number 1. A pediatrician would like to determine the relationship between infant female weights versus age. The pediatrician studies 100 newborn girls and finds their average weight at the end of three month intervals. The data is shown below and graphed on the scatter plot. So we're not going to take time in this course to, you know, like scale a scatter plot and plot little data points and things like that. And I certainly hope no state exam would require you to do that at this level either. So we're just going to start with our scatter plot. All right, we see this nice kind of linear trend. Okay, let's take a look at letter A. Using a ruler, draw a line that you think best fits this data. As a general guideline, try to draw it such that there are as many data points above the line as there are below it. Now, that, that's one suggestion, you know, but of course we, we could do that in many ways. Shoot, if I took this thing and drew a line that just sort of was like that, we'd have about as many above it as we had below it. So that's not the only thing you want to do. You also want to make sure that the line that you're drawing has roughly about the same slope, you know, so maybe, maybe kind of like around that or, or maybe like a little bit of a lower slope, something like, like maybe about that, right? Some kind of line like that, all right? Um, and again, I would like you to sort of do this on your own, but that would be a pretty good one for me. You know, I've got some data points above the line, some data points below the line. I'll eventually just make the line magically appear. Um, but why don't you go ahead and pause the video right now and try to draw a best fit line that you think fits that data pretty well. All right. Well, here I'm just going to do the magic, sort of touch the board and have the line appear. Woo, it's there. Awesome. Um, now, I mean, again, that's just sort of freehanding a best fit line. There is actually one line that fits the data better than all the rest, and the calculator can actually give that to us, but we'll get there in a little bit. Let's take a look at letter B. By picking two points that are on the line, not necessarily data points, Determine the equation of your best fit line. Round your linear parameters to the nearest tenth. All right, so we've come up with equations of lines before. All we need, right, are two points that lie on the line. Okay, let me um, go into red. Now, when we say two points that lie on the line, we mean two points that lie on the line. What we don't necessarily mean are two of the data points. Now, it does look like that maybe that data point lies nicely on the line. Um, but, you know, I want to come in here, I kind of look closely at my line. There's one point that lies nicely on the line. There's maybe another point that lies nicely on the line. That's the point 4, 13. All right, this point is the point 11, 22. All right, and I want to come up with the equation of the line that passes through those two points. And because this is a very practical example, I'd like my slope to not be a, a fraction or my y-intercept a fraction. I kind of want those things to be, you know, like nice decimal kind of numbers so that we can really get a sense for what's going on here. Why don't you pause the video now and regardless of whether you use my points or your points, come up with the equation of the line that passes that, uh, uh, that you drew on that, that scatter plot. All right, let me shift back to blue. 
because for some reason I like that color better. Um, all right, so I'm gonna say the slope is equal to 22 minus 13, all divided by 11 minus four. 22 minus 13 is nine, 11 minus four is seven. And yeah, that's a little bit ugly. Um, uh, here, I'm gonna break out my calculator because I need it to just figure out apparently what um, nine divided by seven is. So I'm gonna do, wait, wait, nine divided by seven? Yeah, nine divided by seven. <laughs> Uh, and I want it as a decimal. So I'm gonna just round that to 1.3. The calculator is gonna give us a, um, the equation of the best fit line. We just wanna do this right now to kinda get a sense for what the thing would be. So I've got my slope, 1.3. To calculate my y-intercept, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say y equals 1.3x plus b. I can now take either one of these two points. I think I'll go with the first one. So I'm gonna substitute 13 in for y and four in for x. So b is going to be 13 minus 1.3 times four. Let's figure out what that is. 13 minus 1.3 times four. And we're going to get our b is 7.8. So for my best fit line, let me see if I can squeeze it in right here. Y equals 1.3x plus 7.8. And in fact, you know, when we look at our line, let me actually go in to our full screen view. Although it might be a little bit hard to see, that Y intercept does look to be very close to 8, right? Here I've got it as 7.8. Now again, that is one equation of a best fit line. But of course, best means that you can't do any better than that, right? It's as good as it possibly gets. So let's get into how our calculator can actually give us the best fit line. All right, let's take a look at letter C. Use your calculator to find the equation of the line of best fit for this data. Round all linear parameters to the nearest tenth. All right. Now, all calculators, all graphing calculators, have the ability to do what's called regression, specifically linear regression, which is to find these lines of best fit. How that is done is very, very calculator dependent. The way that I'm gonna do it on the TI Inspire is slightly different than the way you might even do it on other TIs, like the TI 83 plus or 84 plus. And it's certainly gonna be different than the way you might do it on a Casio or a Hewlett Packard or any other type of calculator that you're using, including online calculators like the Desmos calculator. So just keep that in mind. I wish I could go through every single method. That would be very difficult. Let me go through it for the TI Inspire. So I'm gonna open up my TI Inspire at this point. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually gonna go to a brand new document, all right? And for this, I'm gonna go into Add Lists and Spreadsheet. So in column A, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be putting in my X data. So that is simply these months by three month intervals. Then in my Y data, I'm gonna be putting in those average weights, 7.2, 12.2, 15.1, I wanna be very careful as I put the data in. If I make even a single small mistake entering that data, then what's going to happen is my linear equation's gonna be wrong, right? So as soon as I've got that data in, I wanna go through, I wanna check it, I wanna make sure it's right, because I, I could have the smallest mistake, 25.3 instead of 26.3, and if this is on a standardized test, right, and you chuck down the equation and it's off a little bit, there's not much that the grader can do. All right, let's keep talking about how this is done. Now on the TI Inspire, what I like to do is I personally like to go up to my column headings, and I actually like to put something in. So for me, I like to actually write in something like age in that first column, and I'll show you why this is in a moment. And then I'll put maybe weight down in the second column. I could even do A and W to be quite honest, but I like to label them, all right? As soon as I have that, then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go now to menu, 
All right. Now, when I go into menu, one of my options is statistics. So I'm going to choose statistics. All right. And I'm going to choose statistical calculations. And when I do that, I see a ton of different options, one of which is linear regression choice 3 MX plus B. There's also linear regression A plus BX, and the only difference between the two is one of them gives you the equation of the line sort of in more standard Y equals MX plus B form, and the other one just puts the Y intercept first and then the plus MX, or in this case BX second. I don't know why they give you both of those choices. It's weird. They're going to give you the same equation. So I'm going to go with my linear regression. And now it says X list and it has like a B with a weird bracket on it. But if I hit the right button, what it then does is it gives me those two categories. Now remember, what I want in my X list is my, my age and my Y list is my weight, okay? Nothing else do I really have to futz around with. I can, but I don't need to. I'm going to hit OK. And once I do that, then all of my relevant information is here in this particular column D, right? Gives me a title. I don't care about that. It tells me what kind of regression equation I'm working with, M times X plus B. But then it gives me my M, 1.21691. It gives me my B, 7.8, etc. Right? So I've got those two important parameters, right? All I really wanted was my slope rounded to the nearest tenth, 1.2, my y-intercept rounded to the nearest tenth, 7.8. All right, so we can now get those down. Let's write down our best fit equation rounded to the nearest tenth on both of them, y equals 1.2x plus 7.8. As an aside, if we compare that then to the equation that we got just by peeling off two points, it's pretty close. Now, all that means is that I drew a line that was pretty close to the line of best fit, basically. All right, in fact, the y-intercept is right on the money. The slope was a little bit off, but relatively close. Let's talk about letter D. Use your calculator to determine the linear correlation coefficient, parentheses, the R value, round to the nearest thousandth. All right, and we're going to talk about what the linear correlation coefficient means in a second. But, right, on this particular calculator, all I have to do is look for the R value. Now notice I've got my slope, M, I've got my value of B, my y-intercept, and then as well, I've got my R squared value which is interesting, and in statistics, R squared definitely has a meaning to it. We're not going to go into it right now. The irony, of course, is that what we really want, I want to get rid of that, is we want our R value. All right, we want this thing. And that particular R value is 0.995 rounded to the nearest thousandth. 0.995. And there's nothing magical about rounding it to the nearest thousandth versus nearest hundredth or ten thousandth or anything like that. But I'm going to say that R is 0 0.995. All right, I can go back into my full screen and I'm not going to need my calculator anymore, or at least not for the moment. All right, let's take a look at letter E. How can you interpret the value of the correlation coefficient in terms of the variation in weight due to age? All right, so a little review of the correlation coefficient. For linear correlations, the correlation will always be, the correlation coefficient will be between negative 1 and 1, okay? Now, the reason that you can have a negative correlation is that will occur when as x increases, y decreases, all right? So if you have an inverse relationship, i.e. as one variable increases, the other one decreases, then the r value ends up being negative. However, in our case, obviously, as the age of the infant increased, so did the weight of the infant. So we got a positive value. Now, any r value that is close to negative 1 or positive 1 are what are called perfect correlations. All right, meaning that the data would literally fall right on a straight line. Now our data does not fall 
perfectly on a straight line, but it's very close, which is why that R value is extremely close to positive one. Now again, if it had fallen on a straight line with a negative slope, we would have an R value that was very close to or exactly equal to R equals negative one. All right, so how do we finally interpret this, right? We would interpret this as a very strong positive correlation between age and weight. The closer an R value is to one or negative one, the stronger the correlation is, all right, the closer it is to zero, the weaker the correlation is, all right? And the worse that the really one variable will do in predicting the value of the other variable. This particular equation would do a very good job of predicting the average weight of a female infant based on the number of months of age of that female infant. All right, and I don't know how it would work with male infants, probably pretty badly. All right, let's work a little bit more with this particular equation. All right, let's take a look at exercise number two. Using the equation that your calculator produced in exercise number one, predict the weight of a baby girl after 10 months. Round your answer to the nearest tenth of a pound. This is known as interpolation because 10 months is within the range of the data to create the model. All right, we've already talked a little bit about interpolation and extrapolation, but we're gonna look at those in both exercise number two and number three. Should be very easy, just some number crunching. Why don't you pause the video now and go ahead and find the answer to number two. Always, 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 always really important to understand, right, when you have a correlation equation at all, what units are sort of built into that equation. In this particular equation, right, x is the age of the baby in months, and y is the pounds or the weight of the baby in pounds, right? Very simple, we're talking about 10 months, so we just look at y equals 1.2 times 10 plus 7.8. We can just kind of pop that into our calculator, very simple, and we're going to get 19.8 pounds. All right, real simple. And we have some confidence that that prediction is correct, or at least quite, quite close to being correct, for two reasons. One, because our correlation coefficient was very, very close to one. And two, because we're interpolating. In other words, that 10 months is within the range of our data set. And so we're pretty confident that that prediction is going to be pretty close to being correct. Now, exercise number three, using the equation that your calculator produced in exercise number one, predict the weight of a baby girl after two years. Round your answer to the nearest tenth of a pound. This is known as extrapolation because two years is outside of the data used to create the model. All right, so what I'd like you to do is pause the video now and see what our equation predicts to be the, the weight of a infant baby girl after two years based on this equation. Now, one thing you have to be very, very careful about is actually taking two and plugging it into this equation, right? If you did that, actually, you would find that the weight of an infant girl would be around 10 pounds at two years old, which would be an exceptionally light two-year-old, right? The reason for that is that X is the age of the, the child, but in months, right? And that's absolutely critical two years, right? X is age in months. So in this case, X is going to be equal to 24 months since there are obviously 12 months in a year. So Y is equal to 1.2 times 24 plus 7.8. Again, just cranking it through on our calculator, we would find 36.6 pounds. And again, 
One thing that's very important just to point out in general about extrapolation is that this may be accurate or it may not be accurate. We don't have a great sense for it because our data in the original problem, right, only went up to 15 months and 24 months being past that Perhaps weight gain accelerates after that. Perhaps it levels off more. We don't know for certain because we don't have data that extends out to 24 months. All right. Causation versus correlation. No lesson on linear correlation would be complete without a discussion about these two issues. A strong relationship can exist between two variables without one variable causing the other variable. Or maybe the better way to say that, without the change in one variable causing the change in the other variable. So let's take a look at exercise number four. For her science fair project, Keisha decides to study the relationship between height and spelling ability. She administers a spelling test containing 50 words to 100 randomly chosen people. She then fits the data, the data she finds with the following equation y equals 1.28x minus 43.16 with r equal to 0 0.647. In this equation, y represents the number of words out of 50 answered correctly, and x represents their height in inches. Letter A, how many words would this equation predict a person who is five feet tall will answer correctly? All right, so this, this is simple enough. Why don't you pause the video now and see if you can figure out how many words this equation would predict a, a, a person would answer correctly out of 50 if they were five feet tall. Pause the video and take a moment. Well, again, we have to be a little bit careful here. X represents their height in inches. So we don't want to take five and put it into this equation because that would be predicting how many questions a five inch tall person would answer correctly or how many, how many words they would spell correctly if they were only five inches tall. And that would, be, that would be a very short person. So what we need is x equals five times 12 or someone who's 60 inches tall. Then of course we can just take y equals 1.28 multiply it by 60, subtract 43.16, and we'll end up having y equals, eh, it's like 33.64, but because these are the number of words spelled correctly, we're gonna round that up to 34 words that we predict that this five foot tall person is gonna spell correctly out of 50. Let's take a look at letter B. How would you characterize the strength of the relationship between height and spelling ability? All right, well, is it a strong, is it weak, is it positive, is it negative? Take a look at what I've given you here and try to write something down based on that. All right, well, that's all about the R value. And the R value is 0.647. Now, two things about that R value. One, it's positive, and that means that there is a positive relationship. Generally speaking, right, that means that taller people are spelling more words correctly, all right? But, of course, that 0 0.647 is quite a bit farther away from R equals one than in our first exa example, where we had an R value very close to one. In fact, an R value of 0.647 would be considered only a moderately, a moderate, fit or a moderately strong correlation. So we would say a moderate, a moderately strong positive relationship. And the way we can kind of think about that is that we can say, well, all right, you know, it's definitely showing that as people generally get taller, they generally are going to spell more words correctly, but how well that equation actually predicts the exact number of words that they would spell correctly is you know, not all that great. 
all right? So maybe somebody who's five, five foot tall is gonna spell 34 out of 50 words correctly. Maybe they'll spell more than that. Maybe they'll spell less, right? We don't have a lot of confidence in that 34 word prediction. Let's take a look at letter C. Give an interpretation of the slope of this regression equation in the context of this problem. Use proper units in your explanation. All right, so remember, slope is always a rate, right? Slope is always a rate, and specifically in this case, right, slope is equal to the change in y over the change in x. So I want you to use this idea to see if you can interpret what that 1.28 tells you. All right, well, keep in mind that y is words, right, spelled correctly, and x is height in inches. So if our slope is 1.28, and maybe write that as 1.28 divided by 1, then we can say that for every 1 inch that a person's height increases, the number of words we expect them to spell correctly will increase by 1.28 words. That's it. So for every additional inch of height, the number of words spelled correctly takes forever to write out, spelled correctly, increases by 1.28. Great. So final question, causation versus correlation, letter D. Can Keisha conclude that there's a causal relationship here? In other words, does a person being taller cause them to be better at spelling. Explain. All right, pause the video now and think about this for a moment. And the answer here is no, right? Now you might be saying, well, but wait a second. You know, we had a positive correlation and maybe it wasn't the strongest one on earth, but the R value was, you know, about 0.65. So not terrible, right? But a person being taller is not causing them to spell more words correctly. And in fact, maybe I'll just say no. There is no reason, and I'm coming from this from the perspective of somebody reasonably tall, there is no reason why being taller would cause someone to be a better speller. So what, what's actually happening here? Well, what's happening here is there's actually a third variable that's forcing both of them to change in the same way, and that's age, right? As people age, they generally speaking get taller. And as people age, they generally speaking get to be better spellers, right? A first grader is generally speaking shorter than a ninth grader. And a first grader is generally worse at spelling than a ninth grader. Now at a certain point in time, right, people start getting, stop getting taller and probably stop getting much better at spelling. Although that might get better as you go through life simply because you read more and you see words more and things like that. That third variable has a great name in statistics. It's called a lurking variable, all right? And I'm not gonna write that one down even though it's one of my absolute favorite mathematical terms, lurking variable. It's lurking in the background, right? But I am gonna say this, uh, age, is causing both to increase. And of course you get, you know, you get some people, right? 
You get some people who are, you know, shorter, who are better spellers than people who are taller. I'm not particularly the greatest speller. I think I've even shown that uh, in this particular lesson, all right? And there are certainly people that are shorter than me who are much, much, much better spellers than I am. But I bet I'm a better speller than somebody in general who's in fourth grade, and I'm also taller than them because I'm older than them, right? And that's what's going on here. In general, right, a classic statistical wisdom, do not confuse correlation for causation. Two variables can be highly correlated, highly correlated, meaning you could have an R value in the, the 0.9 to 1 range, but the change in one variable does not have to cause the change in the other. And this happens a lot in the real world where statisticians will go out and they'll study something and they'll draw it up on a dot plot and they'll get a really, really strong correlation between two variables and then people will naturally conclude, oh, well look, this thing is causing this thing without saying, well actually there might be some third variable which is causing both of them to sort of vary at the same time. All right, or in the same way, not the same time, but in the same way. All right, let's wrap this up. So in science, we collect data. And we often want to fit that data with a mathematical equation. But due to all the messiness in the real world, oftentimes those correlations aren't perfect. So we fit them with a best line, or eventually a best parabola, or a best exponential function, or all sorts of other curves, all right? Most often, that best fitting is done by a computer or a calculator, right? Because the techniques to actually figure out what is the best fit line actually rely on calculus and other advanced mathematics that we don't know yet, but we still want to be able to do that best fit work with our calculators. So we'll see this a little bit more as we go through the course. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.